Uh, welcome, this is Terry Fox. Uh, we're still in the DDR4 uh, design overview. This is part two of, I say, an end part series. I don't know where this thing is going to end on DDR4 design. And here we'll talk about signal values and timing. Again, uh, I got my Bachelor of Science degree at Montana State University a long time ago. Uh, you can contact me at tfox at siemc.com. Go to my website. Uh, there's a lot of training material on the website. Uh, if you ask questions, I'm happy to answer them. Just realize that my timing as far as response uh, is going to be fairly open-ended because I'm still uh, teaching classes around North America and literally around the world. Uh, and I've also got consulting jobs I have to take care of. So with that in mind, off we go. Let me get my pointer working right. And here we go. First of all, let's start with the master clock. When the master clock comes in, obviously the master clock is an LVDS type clock. So in other words, there's a clock true and clock complement that are coming in. But the master clock needs to meet certain single-ended requirements. And basically, it is referenced about VDD divided by 2, or we would call this VREF halfway between power and ground, and it has to go up at least to 100 millivolts above and 100 millivolts below. So if I take the above on the true and the below on the complement, that gives me at least 200 millivolts of swing, and that gives me a good, clean uh, clock here. Now, well, let's back up to one other thing. When you terminate this thing, since it is an LVDS type thing, you're typically going to terminate it with a single resistor going between clock true and clock complement at or after the last drop in the daisy chain uh, connection of, of the clock line. Um, what's interesting about this? Well, these are just timings and tables that are taken from uh, the DDR4 advanced data sheet for this. You can read through it. Nothing terribly interesting. Just to say that V input high AC is V ref uh, plus 100 millivolts. Low is minus 100 millivolts. Again, these V ref is externally supplied. The DC is V ref plus 75 or minus 75. And uh, that pretty much does that. Now, what is V input high and V input low for address and command? Well, same numbers. 100, uh, 100 millivolts and DC is 75 millivolts. Again, it's symmetrical because address and command are CTT, center tap terminated type things. They are a balanced about, uh, you know, the center point sort of signals. Now, DDR4 setup and timing. Uh, this is, okay, here we go, setup and timing. Now, if you'll look at this, uh, if we were dealing with, with DDR3, it had a base time, and then it had something that was referenced uh, to VREF CA. So the base time in DDR3 would be at the point that you cross, like, uh, center point plus 175 millivolts, or center point plus 150 millivolts. Over here, when they talk about base, they're saying that it, and, and on DDR3, you if you had the base, you also had D, uh, uh, you had to change the timing because of the rise time of the clock and the address command and control. So I had, if I was dealing with the base, I also had to go to a second table uh, that was referencing the rise time of those signals and add something to the base. In the case of DDR4, when we talk about the base, there's only one base, and that is reference to V input high AC, which is a center point plus 100 millivolts, or V input low AC, which is center point minus 100 millivolts. So this is for the setup time. So the 115 uh, picoseconds is referenced, in this case for DDR2, DDR4 1600, is referenced to plus 100 millivolts or minus 100 millivolts 
of that center point. Now, when we talk about V ref CA, then that timing for address, command, and control, you notice that it's a bigger number. The reason it's a bigger number is that if it is more convenient for you to reference the center point, that is V ref, and I do this a lot of times when I'm uh, uh, when I'm uh, manually calculating things as, used, as opposed to using the uh, Mentor uh, Hyperlinks uh, DDR wizard, uh, then they will give me a number where this timing is valid if I'm going to take the timing to start at V ref as opposed to V ref plus 100 millivolts or V ref minus 100 millivolts. Okay, so as long as you got this, I wasted a lot of time trying to find what was the uh, what was the calibration to this base number because I was so used to thinking in terms of DDR3, but there is no calibration to it. If you hit the number, we're in business. That's the end of that. So this was the setup time. So you see, this is setup time with the S. Here's the hold time with the H. And what is that base timing for the hold time? It says V input high, DC, V input low, DC. That was AC, so that's 100 millivolts. This is DC, that's 75 millivolts. So if you started with 100 millivolts above V ref, you could use this number, and if you wanted to look at the end of your timing at uh, 75 millivolts above V ref as it's coming back down, then it would be 140 plus 115. That is your setup time and your hold time if you're referencing the uh, you know the base numbers, but it has to occur within a pulse width of 600 picoseconds in this case. So if I add 115 and 140, that's only about uh, 255 or so, but I still have to have a pulse width that has to be at least 600 picoseconds for DDR4-1600. So anyway, the point of this is uh, if your brain is set to DDR3, you're going to waste a lot of time trying to find the, uh, you know, the dereferencing, or the, not dereferencing, but the derating table that is associated with the base. It doesn't exist, so save you some time there. Now, when we look at the strobes, strobes have got a true and have got a complement. There's a differential swing, and I guess the point behind this is that the minimum differential swing is 186 millivolts or, uh, high and minus 186 millivolts low. So we're talking about a pretty significant uh, swing in, in uh, terms of millivolts. I mean, this is just a little under uh, 400 millivolts for the swing, uh, which is actually... Uh, you know, pretty pretty significant. Again, it is it is reference to V ref DQ. It's that midpoint because we're using not center tap terminated drivers, but partially open drain drivers. So good enough for that. Now, when we look at the DQ input receiver specifications, there is a V input mask. That is, how many volts is it? Now this is the funny part right here. I've got T data input valid window and here is the TDI pulse width. Now the pulse width is about 58 percent of the unit interval. The valid window is about 20 percent of the unit interval. So in and also this is the, the skew between the strobe and the DQ bits. It's roughly 17 percent is uh, how those things can uh, strobe plus or minus or skew plus or minus. So here we go. Here is the pulse width. So starting at V cent DQ there is a pulse and that pulse has to be about 58 percent of the unit interval for uh, for the data bit. So that's the pulse width. Within that pulse width there is a data valid window and that is about 20 percent of the unit interval. So just remember this receive mask can be here, can be there, it can be any place in there as long as it is within 
validly within the pulse width. All right, here are some examples that I got out of uh, figure 157 on the Micron data sheet. Again, the same one where I pulled everything else. And you can go in and look at that figure and, and get the details of this. This is something that's less of an eye diagram. If you, if you care to stop the video and just simply look at this, you can kind of see exactly what they're saying about the relationship uh, between the data mask and the pulse width. Oh, and also the, uh, the uh, relationship of the strobe and where the mask lands. All right, basic routing and termination. Address, command, and control are daisy chain routed and terminated at or after the last load, and they are terminated to VTT uh, through a resistor. VTT is, is the, uh, halfway between power and ground, and that resistor is approximately 50 ohms and, you know, uh, might be 45, might be 40, but uh, it's, it's uh, that sort of neighborhood. Now, master clock is daisy chain routed and it is terminated after the last load uh, to uh, between uh, clock true and clock complement. So that resistor goes clock true to clock complement and it is located after the last load. It is going to be on the board and is approximately 100 ohms. So this is a regular LVDS load terminated uh, sort of setup. Now, data lines always use control drive strength at the driver and at the receiver always use on die termination. So your data lines, there are no parts on the board. Termination is handled in the chip itself, but you have to set that. Now, all this stuff sounds quite simple, and if you try to just, you know, uh, fly blindly on this, what you're going to end up doing is wasting a lot of time in the lab trying to come up with the correct combinations that make this stuff work. So, a plug for simulation. You are in the big kid world now. You'd better get a hold of a simulator that will tell you exactly what's going on and make sure that you are designing something that you expect to work rather than building something and then trying to fiddle it into proper operation in the lab. That is just a horrid waste of time. All right, so this is the end of part two of the DDR4 design. Now, as I have time, I will add to these uh, slides. The next set of DDR slides, I will, act I will show actual simulations of a, uh, it's actually part of a, of a real project, but it has been uh, uh, all, you know, anything that would lead you to understand what the part really did or uh, who it belonged to is is all been removed, and I have permission to use it. But it was a real, on, real, honest to goodness consulting job that they just simply removed everything that might possibly uh, relate to anything that somebody could understand besides just how does DDR4 work. Now I offer classes on demand throughout North America and actually around the world, for that matter. Uh, right now I'm primarily doing the three-day classes, which. Uh, allow us to go through in a great deal more detail and normally the first two days are explaining how all this stuff works and the third day is generally a, uh, a jump start on a particular project where we apply all of that information uh, to maybe a project that you're trying to get going on. The classes are also available over the web. Uh, I'm always open to answer questions uh, that come in through my website or through the email. Just keep in, time, keep in mind that my response time is not guaranteed due to my teaching and consulting commitments. So, that's it. More later.